yeah, they'll bite you. If you're not careful, even sometimes when you are, you'll, you'll get a, a bite. And you know, that bill is made to tear open carcasses. So uh, sometimes we get our carcass torn. Biologist Chris Parrish is talking about these massive California condors, the birds that he and fellow scientist Eric Weiss are working hard to save from extinction. You learn as a field biologist to endure the elements. Uh, after a while, it becomes kind of funny. If you, if you can't take it with a laugh, then it'll get the best of you. Yeah, Chris and Eric get bit from time to time. It's just in the nature of these condors, which are vultures. What is also in their nature is to eat things that have died. It's how they stay alive. Culturally, we've depicted uh, vultures in general. You know, they sit around in, in the bare trees waiting for things to die. Um, but in that, being a scavenger, they have to be fairly inquisitive and they have to be fairly smart to make it. So if you really want to know what these condors are like up close, Chris says, picture your average Thanksgiving turkey, but with one big difference. Their wingspan can go six, seven, eight, nine feet, sometimes even more. But keeping them alive is a struggle. These x-rays of the birds show bits of lead, bullet fragments that many of the birds eat without meaning to. They are the dark spots on this x-ray, the white spots in this x-ray. The fragments come from bullets hunters use to bring down big game. What the hunters leave behind, the condors eat. What paralyzes the bird as that lead uh, gets into the system. Lead from bullet fragments. And the number one cause of death here is lead poisoning. And we can do something about it. And Arizona hunters are playing a huge role in uh, using non-lead ammunition and, and helping us out. More and more hunters are now using these, copper bullets instead of lead. Chris says by the late 1980s, just 22 of the birds were still alive. The California condor was almost extinct. Chris and Eric work for the Peregrine Fund, working hard to bring them back. Now, there are more than 70. All those crazy yellow lines on this map are a good sign. The lines show where the birds go, clear to Utah, California, and New Mexico, and quite often into the Grand Canyon. Depending on the winds, they can fly 60 miles an hour and travel hundreds of miles in a day. On our visit, two of the birds they've trapped for tests are showing dangerously high levels of lead in their blood. It's kind of a double-edged sword. I mean, if a bird's sick, yeah, you, you don't want them to have lead. You don't want them to be sick. On the other hand, every bird you catch with high lead is one more that you might be able to say. The ones you don't catch that are out there uh, feeding on their own coming across what they may, those are the ones that may die. So I'm pleased we got these two. These will be two that we can probably save with treatment. To do that, they will have to gently cage them, then bring them down off the 1,200-foot vermilion cliffs. For two others, a small victory. No need for treatment. With his bare hands, Chris releases them back into the wild. You're handling a bird that could live 50 to 70 years. This bird might be out there reproducing uh, long after I'm retired. And my kids, maybe even my grandkids, will be able to see that bird. That's doing something in conservation uh, that's for the future generations. I think uh, it's most rewarding. You know? Arizona Highways Television is brought to you by Arizona Public Service and the Arizona Office of Tourism.